Hello, I'm Hersho Montasser. Thank you for listening to the Lighthouse Conversations. We're currently on a short summer break and will return in September with brand new episodes. In the meantime, I wanted to share with you one of my favorite episodes. This is my conversation with Yusuf Adib, the founder of Fatafit, the Arab world's first dedicated food channel that went on to be acquired by Discovery. I spoke to Yusuf in late 2020 about his vision to drum up the likes of Jamie Oliver and Nigella Lawson to prime time and foster a now growing scene of Arab TV chef talents. You know, inside myself is a failure, permanently. I'm in permanent failure. Have you not been able to find a way to heal that or, yeah. or think of it in different ways? Yeah, when you get older and you're like your retirement age, like my age. You look hardly in retirement to me. Alhamdulillah. So. <laughs> you say Alhamdulillah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but there's still that, you know, coming to do this podcast, I didn't sleep for three days. And then I decided last night, you know what, I'm not going to go and try to be perfect. Yeah. Because that's what was paralyzing me. I'm going to come and make a fool of myself. And then I felt free. Welcome to The Lighthouse Conversations, a podcast featuring entrepreneurs and tastemakers from the world of arts, culture, tech, and of course, food. I'm Hesha Montasser, founder of The Lighthouse. My guest today is the charming, talented, and experienced creator, Yusuf Adib. I say creator because that is what his life's work has been all about, to create. He's produced everything from TV commercials to films, and his illustrious career includes the launch of the Arabic food channel, Fatafit, the first native Arabic media brand acquired by a global media company being sold to Discovery in 2012. Incidentally, I met Yusuf for the first time at the Lighthouse. It was a Friday morning, and I heard this gentleman raving to our general manager about something he had eaten. I saw him walk around the book selection of our store, and I just had to find out who he was and what he was raving about. It was the chocolate cake. We, we had a birthday. It was my son's birthday. Ah, happy birthday. Early September, thank you. And um, we didn't know if you had cakes, but we loved everything else that you had. Uh, especially the atmosphere, you know, and it's shirah uh, al makan. Yeah, it is shirah. We asked and they said yes, but uh, so anyways, the chocolate cake. Well, you know, you encouraged me because my wife's favorite is the cheesecake. And for her birthday last week, because you uh, you ordered the double layer chocolate cake, I went ahead and ordered it. And as I was telling you earlier, it was so delicious. And I'm not just saying that because it's a lighthouse, that we finished it for breakfast <laughs> you know, the next day. Chocolate, <laughs> chocolate. Just the word, chocolate. There's something about chocolate. You're 100% right. Well, I want to dive in. I will start with a slogan that seems to follow you, uh, that's on your shirt as well, which I love. And I saw uh, some of your posts online. And it says, Al-Haya Halwa, which I think is a beautiful uh, slogan in a way. I don't know if it's a life philosophy. I don't know what brought that up, but I'd love to start there and go from there. Thank you. Uh, It is a life philosophy. Okay. And um, uh, to, to, to explain to you where that comes from, I have to explain to you that, you know, I, I come from a broken home. And my mom lived in Cairo. We lived in Alexandria. And my father was in Gaza. He worked with the UN. He was in when Gaza. When Gaza was part of Egypt. I don't know. If you're too young to know. 100%. No, I definitely remember. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm just curious. When you say broken, I mean, just because you were divided? Is that divorced. A, uh, divorced. Okay. They were divorced when I was one year old. Okay. So whenever my mother visited us, which was six hours a month, she would come on the train in the morning, take us to Delis in Alexandria. I don't know if you know Delis. I'll have my baba, three guys from Italy playing classical music in the corner. This is Alexandria that we grew up in. You know, my, Wonderful Alexandria. My bus driver for school was Greek, yeah. Egyptian Greek. You know, it was multicultural. Like, it's the kind of stories E.M. Forster talks about when he talks about Alexandria and Israel as well. So right. When I have a story with Lawrence and his brother in my real life that oh I'm going to tell okay. you about. Yeah. hear about that too. So whenever we saw her, and for me, I was the youngest of five. At two o'clock, she would be, we know, she's heading to C.D. Gabbard to catch the train. And sorry to interrupt, who did you live with? My grandparents. Your grandparents, okay. So when I was like crying and, you know, she's leaving, banging yeah. my, my, my feet on the ground and just in tears and pulling at her dress, she would always tell us, remember... So I was too young to understand it. And then when I grew up, as I got to know her and came back, when we went to Canada, came back, lived with her for a few years, then I understood what she went through throughout her life, through the divorce, you know, through separation from her children, you know, how awful it is. And, and, and always her perspective was, meaning there is 
a sweet part of life that you should choose to look at. There's a silver lining. There's, there's a silver lining, and it's how you, you know, what glasses do you wear? Sure. Do you want to say, do I want to say, like, you know, I lost my hair? Sure. Or do I say, wow, I've had a lot of experiences in my life? That's yeah. how, you know, it's Haya Halwa. Glass half full. Tab. A year before she died, we launched Fatafit, and the slogan of the channel was, in her honor. And it was sung, you know, every 10 minutes. It was the jingle, it was the, the slogan of the channel, and I wanted millions of kids to hear it. So it's become my philosophy in life that, uh, you know, life is wonderful. And were both your parents Egyptian? Yes. But, but my, on my mother's side, she's from um, Syrian, Lebanese, Shawam. 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 Lebanese don't like to be called Shawam, but, <laughs> you know, like Shawam. <laughs> um, who came, who migrated to Egypt in the last century, you know, the 1920s or something. So her father was born in Egypt, but his father came from Homs Zahla, you know, okay. from that okay. area. Okay. During the 67 war, my father, who was a civilian working for the United Nations, um, and that's where we spent every summer in Gaza. Like, I grew up in Alexandria, but I never went to the beach in Alexandria because the day school would be finished. We'd be in a, you know, traveling to Gaza that's amazing. to spend the summer with my dad. And the best beaches for me in the world that I have nostalgia Gaza? for were in Gaza. Gaza. Yeah, and he, I remember playing in the sand in Gaza and finding Roman coins. Believe this or not. Yeah, he, no, I believe it. And then I throw it away. Or finally, I remember the beach we went to, the United Nations civilian beach. staff beach. They found in it a Roman at the top, because it's on a hill. There's a hill. Uh, at the top of the hill, they found a mosaic floor from a Roman Insane. temple or something. Like this. We, you know this. We grow up sure. with history going through our nostrils. You know, in, in, in the Especially Alexandria. I mean, especially during the period you were there. Yeah, so in 67, the war, the craziness of the war, I was in Alexandria, he was taken as a prisoner of war, although he was a civilian. For six months, we didn't know anything about him until the Red Cross did an exchange, and we, he came back, and immediately he applied for immig immigration to Australia and to Canada, and, you know, flip of the coin, Canada came first. At the time, it was easy. And I found myself on a plane and asking my sister sitting next to me, where are we going? And she took out, you know, how they have the, I was 12, you know, how they have the flight, the magazines. Yeah, and yeah. Here, she we're took going it out here. and there was a map and she pointed to Canada and I saw the United, United States. And, you know, when we spent the summers in Gaza at the club, there's a civilian club every night, they play movies. Because we weren't living in Egypt, it was Gaza, but it was the United Nations so I grew up watching cowboy movies, and the minute she pointed to this America, is where we're going, yeah. I thought, oh no, I got scared. We're going to. <laughs> and all five kids went with, 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 with the dad. Yeah, yeah. Then at the age of 13, Yusuf joined the sea cadet camp that was supervised under the Navy. This naive kid from St. Mark in Alexandria yeah. ends up in, in a building in Scarborough, Ontario, part of Toronto. I don't know if you know Toronto. There's a suburb called Scarborough. Okay called Scarberia, and that building was all immigrants. But in my time, all the immigrants were from where? From Scotland, Ireland, Poland, you know, Estonia. And there comes this Egyptian kid. And then there's this Egyptian, I mean, at school, they used to take me around and say, look, he's from Egypt, in front of the, each class. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Our neighbors who are sc Scottish, they have a tradition in Scotland. At midnight, New Year's Eve, they would take me and say, ask my dad, can he come and knock at our door at midnight, like just at midnight? A just minute after midnight, please. Not before, just a minute after. And I'd go and I'd knock and I'd open the door, take me in, and I wish them a happy new year, give me a piece of cake. Apparently it's a tradition in Scotland that the first person coming to your home in the new year should be dark-skinned oh, so and funny. tall and handsome. I wasn't tall or handsome, but I was, <laughs> to them, dark-skinned. Relatively dark-skinned for them, yeah. Only a year later, I playing under the building, I see a kid next door wearing a proper old Navy uniform, you know, with the round cap and... Uh, lanyard and stuff. And I asked him, what are you doing? And he said, well, we go for training once a week. You know, we learn to march, we learn to fire rifles, and then in the summer we can apply to go to camp. So I asked my dad, can I join this? I don't know what it is, but I like that, you know, he was... The pomp, the, the uniform. Yeah. He said, sure. So I joined, and in the summers they would fly us on Canadian Air Force planes from Trenton, Ontario, to British Columbia, to Vancouver Island, take a ferry to Vancouver Island, to a small island connected by road to the land. So it's called a spit. Food, security, bedding, 
marching band. I did that for four summers. Can I play pseudo uh, psych psychological analyst for a second and say, do you feel that part of the appeal was the fact that maybe you needed some control and discipline over what has been largely kind of a very, you know, I mean, a lot of movement for a young kid. I mean, you know, you've moved all around. There were a lot of kind of different things. You lived in Alexandria, then all of a sudden you find yourself in Canada. And maybe this gave you, maybe the word is predictability. Did, was that part of the appeal or was it just a uniform? <laughs> no, I, I think I wanted to escape. Okay. I wanted to escape the home. Not that it was a bad home, but I just wanted to discover my my world. What was your father doing in Canada after you've I there? He, he, Allah Rahmah, he passed away many years ago. He was an accountant. Okay. I wanted to find life. I wanted to discover life. And it's funny, like I had only been in, uh, I wasn't Canadian. I was just an immigrant. Lisa, you can, I am in the a, process. At the time, you had to wait five years. When I went to Canada, my character changed. I became very curious, extremely curious. So joining this Ikadets was curiosity. When my father bought the Encyclopedia Britannica, and at the time, you know, you'd get one volume per month. I remember that subscription. That. I think, I don't remember except me reading it. I would sit every night and just discover the world, you know, like, uh, just curious. So the, joining the Sea Cadets was for me curiosity, adventure. You know, I, you know, I read about, you know, Gypsy Moth, all the people who sailed around the world single-handed. At the time, I wanted to, I was, I was still speaking half English, Yani, Khalid sure. But I wanted to, all of a sudden I wanted to discover the world and sail the world alone, you know, and uh, that gave me that release. And when did you start realizing that you clearly had kind of a creative side to yourself that you wanted to apply? And how did that all manifest itself? You know, my grandfather, when we visited Cairo, my grandfather, like my mother's father, he taught me to, he, was, he loved photography. And he taught me to take pictures, how photography works and to develop black and white film in his bathroom darkroom when I was wow. eight. When at 17, something happened between me and my father where he said, you're on your own. We're in Canada, you're on your own. And um, immediately I thought, what am I going to do? And, I th and then I realized I wanted to express myself. Th that was the initial trigger. So to express myself, what am I, I'm going to study film. At the time I joined a fine arts university because I wanted to see all the arts, and, and part of it was film and photography. So, And did you feel your influences were more Western and what you've seen in Canada, or did you also have influences from perhaps Egypt or, or the Middle East? Obviously, Egypt has had, over the years, many filmmakers, artists, etc. Was that part of your influence over time? I, I think we, all of us who are immigrants as children, all of us, suffer from that you know, schizophrenia of having, you know, this tug of war in our minds and in our hearts between, 100%. between you know, the West and, and the East. So I've always had the East. It's that hybridity. I mean, we all have. Even if you didn't fully immigrate, by the way. Oh, okay. For many in of the modern us, world, yeah, the exposure yeah, to... I mean, I grew up in Cairo all my life and left to, to school in the States at 19. And I still have that hybridity between sort of East and West. So I think it's very common at various levels, but very common. So sorry, I think ahead. you're probably right with the exposure to the West, with, you know, with the internet and, and 100%. all that. 100%. But yeah, I, I, um, so I ended up studying fine arts at a very rebellious university. The, you know, very, yeah, I mean, if you painted what you thought your professor, who are all artists in themselves, wanted, they would tear it up. Their mission was to get what's inside you. Not, you know, you're smiling because I see other art schools where, you know, if you don't do it the way he did it, the way he learned it in Moscow, then you're, right. you're out, you know. Correct. So, and then, I, and then I said, no, I really want to do film, so I moved to Toronto, to Ryerson. And this is what kicked off Yusuf's career in media, starting out assistant on documentary films, moving on to roles in advertising, production, filmmaking, and his favorite, writing. I think what, what I settle best in is, yes. in is in creating. So the closest to creating is writing, okay. painting, let's say, um, devising shows, Writing, um, so in the creation, the creativity side of it is where, where is my home, where I find myself. Is it the content or the process of both that draws you most? So one thing is I'm writing, another one is I'm actually, you know, producing, setting this up. I mean, I, I like both, but like but both. but I prefer the, the creative the writing, process, yeah, the, the writing, the actual, part. you know, the content production. I, there's a funny incident. One, of my 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 film theory, because you learn film theory, you learn film history, you learn. 
then you learn the craft. You learn lighting, you learn editing, you learn acting, you know, you do all these things. My film theory teacher, Marta, Marta Braun, I remember her name, she said to me, you, you know, you're a writer. Get, get out of this school. Just go and write. And she actually offered me to stay. Funny if things happen in our world, in our life, you know, when we think back. She offered me her farm that she owned with her husband in Luca, outside of Pisa in, in, in Tuscany. She said, here, take the keys. Go stay there for a year and write. But I was at film school. And then what happened? I bummed around the Caribbean for, you know, for six months. Bummed around Europe twice. Two years I spent bumming around Europe. As one does. <laughs> at the time, one did more because at the time, it was the tail end of the 60s and, and there was this vibe about going away to discover yourself. Sure. I'm going to go to Europe and discover Well, that vibe it. apparently is still there, by the way. It just manifests itself differently today. How? I think people go kind of <laughs> digitally. On Instagram? Yeah, exactly. And find themselves on, you know, on the internet. But I think the, the wanting to find yourself is a, it's pretty consistent over the decades. Sorry, it's go ahead. wonderful in youth that they want to discover themselves, I think. You know, the future is in our youth and in how they see the world, not in us. You know, to the youth, and, and it's their world. They're going to live in it, not us, you know. like uh, 100%. Funny thing is, at film school, I refused to, we used to have to do film projects every week. So one of the projects was to do a TV commercial. And I refused to do it. Why? Because I'm an artist. Ah. It's I'm not going to prostitute craft. myself. Right. So because I refused, you know, the powers of the universe said, Really? So you're going to spend the next 10 years doing nothing but TV commercials. Did you enjoy it? I love it. You love it. I loved it then. I think today the process of producing commercials, it's probably much more structured, much more metrics and all that, but it's lost its soul somehow because, you know, like Tariq Noor is a pioneer. Regardless of what you think of him, he's a pioneer. And remained relevant for a very long time. Maybe still is. Yeah, he still is. He became huge at a time when... You know, there was a Lahram advertising agency and there was Tariq Noor. And if a Lahram hit the client, you couldn't touch that client forever. The client couldn't leave them. If the client didn't like their work. If I, during, and he, he made it. So creativity in, um, in advertising then, where you could just come up with a wonderful, passionate idea, we're missing that today. You know, and I, I think, I, I could be wrong. I don't watch all the commercials that are being produced. I'm just going to be devil's advocate. I can be as creative today, even if the medium or which as a consumer has changed, it doesn't mean that a good ad doesn't pop. It just pops on something else. You can be just as creative. Correct. The stakeholders, to clarify what I'm trying to say, the stakeholders are relying too much on metrics. That's what I mean, the data. It's too much data. Too much reliance on data and passion and love and falling in love with a product or an object or being inspired you know, why do people want to buy a Harley? Is it all because of the shape and size and the sound? No, there's something, you know, about it that comes through, came through advertising and film and, you know, it's not metrics. But you have another medium today, which is a phenomenon like TikTok, some of the others, where there's, you can go viral with things that amateurs produce. So while probably in the professional world, you're right, it's become much more studied because they're relying on data. You and I, as non-professionals, well, you are professional, but me, I could go at home today and produce an ad, yeah. and there's a good chance it'd go viral on TikTok, and I'd become as important as... No, no, it's true, and it's a new world, and I'm not saying one is better yeah. than the other, but the new one comes with baggage. Mm. And if you allow me to say the supercomputer, there's supercomputers somewhere in the planet, and they can direct messages to you around the advertising. Look at what's happening in the U.S. 100%. So it comes, you know, that openness comes with, with a lot of, of crap. And that's precisely what's happening now with these platforms like Facebook and others, where they're saying we are neutral, uh, neutral parties. We cannot influence what is put out there. But of course, it's having a huge they amount of influence. They are nothing but influence. You know, every time you scroll, 100%. there's a computer out there saying, yeah. oh, Hashem, I know he likes chocolate and he likes this. And he, yesterday he did this. So... Give him this, and you don't even realize it. And I think more importantly than that, it can obviously be very dangerous because let's say for a second if I had some, let's call them extreme thoughts of sorts, and the algorithm knows that, what well, we hear, especially in the US, but in other parts of the world as well, a lot of people have been radicalized this way, right? It's feeding me more and more of what I've been clicking on, and therefore my thought process being influenced, especially young people, by what I'm reading, and that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and very, very dangerous. So look, I, I agree with you. But that's a whole different subject. That's um, a whole different subject, including, you know, getting people used to a short attention span. 
not yes. being able to read more than four words in a row and then, you know, scrolling. But that's another story. That story will probably require a whole other podcast episode. So for now, if you want to order one of those fabulous chocolate cakes of the lighthouse, order online via Linktree on our Instagram account, and please leave us a note and let us know what you thought. By 1990, Yusuf Adib had moved to Kuwait, where he spent close to a decade producing commercials with the Khurafi Group for their big franchise assets, KFC, Pizza Hut, Baskin Robbins, and others. After a stint at one of the region's biggest media companies, NBC, he returned to Egypt and joined hands with the Khurafi Group, this time to produce films. So we set up a film company in Egypt. We produced two films. The first one, we, the first one was Dorid Laham, a family picture like Sound of Music, with kids, actors, etc., with uh, Hanan Turk and Dorid Laham, Ismul Aba al Sigar, musical. Because that's where we come from, Al-Haya Halwa. We wanted to do things for families. And for those that are just not aware, can you just explain who Dorid Laham is? Because I think that's significant. I mean, it's important. Dorid Laham is the, um, the iconic Syrian actor. actor, comedian, wonderful with kids, a great man. So this was a big coup in a sense. It's I'm like just Chaplin. Trying, it's right, like you say, I worked with that Chaplin. It was a big coup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To bring Dorid Laham to, to and it was star a, in your movie. It was a film he wrote, and it was sitting in his drawer for like 20 years. We produced it. Produced it. In Syria. And then um, that's when I discovered that there's something absolutely wrong with the industry in that in Egypt, producers own the theaters and own the distribution, which is illegal. In, Anywhere else. But it wasn't in our interest to to place our film. So they put it in the theaters for two weeks. You know, the, the benefit to me of that film is the saving grace and it ran on Emirates uh, for six years. So you're saying it, it didn't really get any exposure in the cinemas, In right? the theaters. But, but it did on Emirates, ironically, and that's yes. how it became exposed. Because they have someone curating who gets it. This yeah. is a family movie. We need a family movie. Yeah. And then I did another film. I produced another film. It's Asulaz. Asa Ulez went on to win Best Film at the Cairo International Film Festival that year. But given the limitations of the Egyptian film market and the hegemony of the distributors, Yusuf set his sights on television. I remember at NBC, and even watching like Dubai TV and Abu Dhabi TV, everybody ran the food shows as filler. Correct. Like it doesn't matter who is doing it, it's filler. Yeah. You just ran it like 2 p.m., yeah. it's filler. So I thought I'll do a food channel. And I'll do a music channel. Two things that popped to me when I was doing some research for this episode. One is your relationship with food is very profound. And there seems to be an echo throughout your life of in, way, in a way that the memory of food, if that makes any sense. Nostalgia for food. The nostalgia for food. But you clearly also connect food with family and communities. Yeah. Is I that think, right? I think food shows me. I, I can't say I consciously chose yeah. it. It shows me in the sense that I was young, I, I lacked food. My mother would smuggle boiled eggs when she came to visit. Well, and one would, of your quotes was, anyone can bribe me with a boiled egg. Exactly. So, and we would hide. I'm going to try doing. Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll see if it still works or not. <laughs> and uh, so food, you know, lack of certain foods when I was young, like smelling butter on my friend's sandwich at school and jam, which I didn't have. I had butter for the first time when I was 13 when we went to Canada. This is another story that it's not important, but I'm just saying it to explain my relationship to food is through lack of food, missing food, nostalgia for food, and then realizing food is that great uniter, the great uniter of us as human beings. But you also seem to think, and I agree with you on that, in a way that food is timeless and you like the simplicity of it. It's not about fussiness. It's not about making no, something man, no, I'll tell you. overly sophisticated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you, when we launched, going back to launching Fatafit, so I decided to launch a food channel. I wrote to Food Network. Bang, they answered me. Flew to New York. I actually literally flew for one day and flew back to sign with them as the exclusive partner in the Middle East. And no Blessing. one had thought of that at the time. Fillers. Yeah, as said, filler. They were fillers. Fillers. Filler. Um, Chicken. So, filler. so Jamie Oliver was running on Dubai TV as filler. I took it. I took him, bought his show, ran it as a second run on Fatafit prime time and drummed him up. And then people discovered, but he was already there for years. Martha Stewart. Nigella Lawson. Nobody would run her because, you know, she's Jewish at the time. You know, that was a thought. I launched her and women fell in love with her because she wasn't thin and... Sure. Uh, yeah. 
يعني بتاكل يعني بارتي اه يا ف when i launched for the feet it was unusual in the sense we did not do food in real time at the time food shows were real time so you put the salt and you wait for it to boil and actually on tv they waited for it to boil you know <laughs> which makes no sense and then you stir it for two minutes <laughs> and then the recipe would appear in in the years i was at fatafit since we launched we did not put one single recipe on the screen ever because we were inviting people to be creative it didn't matter and 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 we 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 treated the audience like they're smart. We didn't remove wine when it was in a Western show. We just translated it as um, vinegar or khalana uh, biyani. So, and the audience appreciated. Before, this is before a lot of social media wasn't really big at the time. So emails were, and you know, my colleagues at Fatafid at the time can vouch for this. We used to receive hundreds of thousands of emails of people thanking us, women telling us, you know what, you just made me a hero with my kids again. Yeah, uh, we brought But the family together. Launched, I want to just emphasize this. It wasn't just Nigel Lawson and Martha Stewart. You launched regional, local. Yeah, we 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 started. Well. We had to have our own. You know, we had to have relevance. We didn't yes. want to be like Food Network. So Arab chefs. So we launched Or Arab chefs. Many, many, many. Like I, you know, about a dozen, let's say. And how did you go about to find them? Your guess is as good as mine. Sometimes it was just an email that we got. Like um, Hamad Orfali, mm, who's going to open his restaurant, Allah Yibarik Lusuni, yani, sure. was working as a sh- chef in Kuwait. And I, one of my trips to Kuwait, I met him in the lobby of the Crown Plaza. And uh, <laughs> and you were like, sure, send me something. Let me see, let's do a test. And, you know, I, I flew in, I tell him on camera, and he expected like some big test. And I said, can you make an omelet? Because it wasn't about the food. It's about the personality. People don't watch the food, they watch the personality, yeah. you know, and... Same with uh, Chef Layla Fathallah from Beirut, who's now like has 600,000 followers on Instagram. Go figure. Yeah. And she just sent us her video because they're good people. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm sorry if I forget anyone, but, no, no. but always it wasn't about recipe. But here's the difference. With, we, we had, a, we had lux, the luxury of five years of no competition. Clients would come to our door and say, where are you? Who's your ad rep? You know, because we, we were too small. The whole budget of Fatafit was like one show on NBC. And we were filming in HD, and we couldn't afford to broadcast in HD, but I was building an HD library. I was looking like years ahead. And that's how Discovery bought it, because all the library was in HD. So you were obviously very aware of the fact that building content, and you were also aware of the fact that digitalization, digitization was coming. Yeah, I was aware of those, but I, mostly I was building a brand. I was building loyalty with mothers and women. I'm just women. trying to hear, say something because I think your creative side is married also with a savviness in terms of commercial, commercialization. I'm not being commercialization in a negative sense. I'm saying that you understand that it's a business after all. Uh, I, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I people do, can't marry the two. Some people are highly creative, are great at producing shows, but then they cost a billion dollars each no, time, no, no. and then the whole thing sinks. Of course, of course. Because, you know, it comes from making TV commercials. Probably. You can't just keep doing it because they look good. Correct. They have to deliver, you know, sales or, or, or returns. So we um, we produced our own shows. And here's the difference between, to this day, what we were doing then and, and food shows in the Middle East. We had a back kitchen, like like a restaurant. We had chefs, like a whole structure of a restaurant, working overnight for the episode we're filming the next day. So we tested recipes. Even though we never talked about recipes, we tested them. It wasn't just... doing stuff. Isn't that extraordinary? I mean, I, I read about uh, one of the biographies, autobiographies of one of the ladies that used to run gourmet magazine in the US. And they had a massive kitchen. And it's the kind of luxury that today is unheard of. I mean, no magazine, well, there's barely any magazines left. Yes. But that was very important to the legitimacy and the quality control. Of course. And, and, and it's, it, it pays off with your brand and with the stickiness of your brand with your customers. To this day. So why did you sell it then? Oh, well, <laughs> I didn't want to. Well, though, maybe your, your, your investors. My investor, I woke up one day, he had passed away. Oh, wow, okay. And that whole group. Changed. Family, family groups, you know. They changed, yeah. The, the sons want something else. So they said, we want to sell. And um, I was blessed. I, I wasn't happy. To this day, I'm like, it's my baby. 
Somebody took my baby. Did you find this traumatic in a way? Because very, you built this five-year-old very, very, child and all of a sudden you have to give it away? It was horrible and I turned into a horrible person. Even though I found, I was blessed to discover, I contacted a friend, I had a discovery. Within a day he said, yeah, we want to buy. And they flew in and they spent a year doing due diligence, which is kind of ugly due diligence, when, you know, because they're trying to get it for the least thing. Of course. So it was horrible that I had to let it go. And, and uh, they asked me to stay on, but, you know. It's different. Now you're part of a bigger corporate but structure. But sit on the side like Giddoy. And, and I didn't want to, so I left. And during that period, that's how traumatic, I decided, to, I remembered my core value and what I really wanted to do. And that's what I made my, wrote and directed my own film. Yeah, Loves Improvisations, which then launched at Dubai Film Festival, went to Monaco Film Festival, saint Tropez, Madrid, London. In London, the actor, Nicola Mawad, uh, won Best Actor for that film. So that was kind of a silver lining, you know. You'll find that typically in life when you f face challenges, you've dealt with it with increased creativity or more whether, I mean, some people get a complete block, they can't, they can't produce when they're, or how do you deal with, with those challenges? I, I go through the shock, like everyone else, but I pull myself, you know, out of it immediately and find the So your mother was right? Absolutely. I want to say absolutely, you know, you yes. can cut that out. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> she, she went through a lot. You cannot imagine what she went. She taught us one thing, al Haya Halwa. And uh, we wrote this film, or I wrote this film, and I acted in this film about relationships and how relationships change, because I think you want to know about that. But I related it to, uh, I was taking lessons to play out at the time. Oh, wow. And um, I learned about Ma'amat. Like Arabic music is so different from West. Western, you have chords. خلاص. لا. إحنا بقى تختلف. We have ma'amat, and if I get it, if I explain it right, ma'amat is a group of notes. So I started reading, and I discovered that there, like the Quran, can be recited in, according to the ma'amat of music. Amazing? Yeah. Uh, Jewish synagogues use the same ma'amat by the same names. I did not know that to, so for prayer. Okay. And I thought, how music, music can. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. I mean, so I so I have eight scenes in the film, and each is a ma'am. My my good friend Yahab Radwan, who's a world famous Odist, lives in Paris, composed it for me, the music. And each scene about a, a, a different stage in the relationship of this couple is related to a ma'am ma'ayan. Yeah. Funnily enough, I mean, last week I was mentioning you earlier when it was my wife's birthday. And I decided to invite the old player to play, uh, just for us and our children. And partially it's because I didn't feel my children know much about the old and, and they don't get, you don't get much exposure to it, even in Dubai, a bit more than elsewhere. And it, it, there's something about, to me at least, old that is just incredible. For always, I felt that it's like the sound of my soul. Souls, yeah, exactly. souls are like old. even physically as an instrument. Yeah. It it's, looks it's very intimate. Like yeah, you hug exactly. it. Exactly, exactly. So I'm still not living in any place long enough to have a teacher, but that's like a retirement project that I'll have a teacher and he'll come every day and like teach you, teach how to me. Play. Yeah, you have to learn it from someone. You can't just do it. One of the things that I found really, honestly, and I'm not saying this because you're here, wonderful, going through your story, is uh, your ability to have been able to do multiple things in your life. Many of them very successfully. Some of them maybe not as successfully, but that's not the point. The point is being able to reinvent yourself and keep going. It's something we talk about a lot. I mean, I'm on a much more modest scale, but someone that, you know, was trained as a banker and worked in banking for many years before switching over, becoming an entrepreneur and now doing different things. And we talk about it on the show quite often. I find that very important that all of us found ways to find ways of expressing ourselves and that could evolve over time, but it also can be in parallel. And you seem to have done that quite a bit in your career in general. So now you've gone back to writing as well, right? And you've just produced a children's yeah, I've, I, um, book. One day, yeah. First, I'll, I'll tell you. Yes. You know, when you're an immigrant, um, 
you get thrown in the deep end. I used to get beat up at school every day. Mm. Oh, you're from Egypt because we just lost the war. And they'd beat me up. Amazing. And the funny thing is the only kids that came to my help were the Jews, the Jewish kids in the car. You understand. Absolutely. So when you're in that situation, you're an immigrant and you get beat up and you're a nobody in a, in a new environment of, you know, uh, you learn to, I'm going to either die or I'm going to survive. So you learn survival. So you know what? Do you want a good waiter in your restaurant tomorrow? I can do it. I, I, I have no problem. I, I'll do anything. That's my approach to dealing with different things, surviving, trying different things, giving it my best. Have you been able to bring them together in a way that gives you inner kind of peace and happiness and contentness? That's very difficult. And I find a lot of very creative people struggle with this. When you read Edward Said, part of his brilliance is that inner struggle, which he then wrote about in his autobiography, but you really feel that tension, right? And part of it is anger as well. He talks about, you know, his, his childhood in Egypt, but also going back to Palestine and so on. So how much of, of that do you feel is fueled? fueled I, I don't know if I had a wonderful childhood, if I would be who I am now. Okay. And I'm not saying... No, 100%, I get that. It's good to have a bad childhood. No, no, of course. But you used it to it, fuel... It, it drives me. And it, yeah, it drove you. You know, inside myself is a failure. Permanently. I'm in permanent failure. That inner voice, I think, is you're not the only one. I'm sure you know that. All of us, yeah. I mean, many of us have that inner voice. I mean, I have a very punishing inner voice. And similar to you, it's, it's sometimes paralyzing. And I have to work on it constantly to remind myself that... Um, and I have to hear from the outside to get affirmation. Yeah, that's um, important. Yeah. We're human beings. Yeah, which is, which is good, but also exhausting. So, and, and I didn't have, I mean, you know, uh, being open, I mean, I didn't have a childhood in any way that, that was difficult. But you find other ways to punish yourself. And, and, but we all need something to drive us. I think. I think it's part of who we are as human beings, that dissatisfaction. We're always looking for something else. I, I just wanted to say about the book, Please. Fearless Me. Yes. One day, my grandson, um, uh, Zaid. How old is he? He's five now. He was, when he was two. <laughs> there was a sound. I was visiting. We were visiting him, Dina and I, and a bang outside, and he got scared. Like, I want to destroy whoever scared my grandson. You know, like I felt that protection, protective sense. So I immediately, I said, I'm going to write him a book about being fearless. So I wrote the book, Fearless Me. And it's 10 situations of his age of how to be fearless. So is a noise making you fear? Make a noise that's bigger than that noise. Make the noise scared of you. Hakeza, are you afraid of the dark? Get a flashlight, light around, and the dark will go away. So I wrote the book, and he, I'm glad that he likes it. And, it and my granddaughter now, Lara, who's two. Loves it too. Likes it too. Yusuf, I, I, again, I don't want to overly analyze. It feels a, when I looked at it, I looked at it online on your website. And was there a bit of also, I mean, as you said, the light, uh, the bringing light to a dark room, etc., conquering your demons kind of situation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah, you're yeah. bigger than that. You can. Yeah, yeah. Don't sit back and take yeah. it. Don't fight. Yeah. There's an active yeah, element yeah, as opposed yeah. be to being proactive. Passive. Be proactive. Yeah. And that was parallel. You wrote a piece that I also found on, I think, on your website, Dear Young Arab Creative. Yeah. Um, which is on sort of a series of advice. Yeah. Uh, I just felt that. Actually, it's actually out of date because the revolution in Egypt, I think, Fatah had kida, this bab of creativity. I'm so proud. Like I see amazing creativity, just unbelievable. Yeah, from nowhere, it, there was none there at the time when I wrote it. I just felt that free yourself. You know, I wanted to write to. I wish I could talk to. You know, I've always wanted to teach. You know, I, this is like it's not too late. Yeah, it, but I've always wanted to teach. In the sense of only freeing people, not to teach them anything, but to free them to get what's inside them out. So that piece was written for that. And then during COVID, I, um, I, just, I wanted to occupy myself. So I did two things. I scanned all my grandfather's negatives. We had like thousands of negatives. That Your so maternal worked. grandfather or yeah. paternal? Yeah, maternal. the one who taught me photography. Because right. he had left these negatives and I scanned them. And now the whole family is seeing... Events and you put some of them online because I saw one of those black and white to negative. My on, on Khali. Khali was the first yeah. magician Very on, regal. I on Egyptian that. TV. Yeah, he he. Can be it la. Baramagil atfali amal sahar. 
Anyways, so, so I did that, and I did um, because I saw my daughter suffering, or not suffering, but you know, it was troublesome for parents to do homeschooling. Uh, sure. Last year, uh, last school year. So I I did this daily. I hired an artist, and um, it's a sheet that's coloring and practice of the letters of the Arabic alphabet. That's creative because most of the Arabic books that I'm aware of, because I don't want to insult anyone who has done a good job are very boring and come from 1952. Yeah. You know. And rigid. Very rigid, yeah. structured. Yeah. Yeah. If I, if so I put it online and for trace, free, right? yeah, trace, and, and it yeah, has the word. That. And in the picture are all the words that um, yeah. from that letter. And I put one letter every day, and I went back to Facebook. I hadn't been on Facebook for years, just to promote it. I saw and that. And women love it. Now I need to print the book. If you were to get a shot at teaching, where would you like to be? You seem to me, and I just want to preface this by saying, it seems to me that your Arab heritage is very important to you. Oh, yeah. And that you, to me, look very much at home here, uh, whether it's in Dubai, and I'm sure in Alexandria or Cairo would be the same. So would you see yourself, for example, going back to Egypt and teaching there? Um, in 19, um, 1979. Okay. I came across the Alexandria Quartet. Fantastic. I finished the fourth, there are four volumes. I finished the fourth one. On, on the next day, I flew back to Egypt. Wow. Because I felt I, you I mixed, to be there. but my heart is more Egypt. So yeah, I think I can add value in the Middle East in teaching. Um, funny thing is, I read that book by Lawrence Doro. Came back to Egypt, tried to work in cinema, didn't like it. I was a kid at the time. Went back to Toronto. And the job that I had with, was with his brother, Gerald Durrell, who was in Toronto. Oh my God, small world. Editing. He had finished filming The Amateur Naturalist, a 13-part TV series. And I was his second assistant editor. Amazing. The world is weird. The world, how it turns, how things happen, uh, serendipity, you know. You know. And then his, the book he wrote, he wrote for me a nice thing in his book. He passed away. He, has a, he used to have a zoo on the Virgin Islands. and uh, I mean, I feel like you have a few more chapters ahead of you. May or, they may or may not include teaching. But well, I mean, have you seen the book? How do you one? know? The, well, the chapters. How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> Can you give me a hint? Uh, yeah, I, I, I haven't seen the book. I haven't seen the book. But I get a sense of your energy and your passion and the fact that you seem to be nowhere near finished in what you want to say. So you'll find ways of saying what you want to say, whether it's in writing, whether it's... No, but you, I think you misread me. I have nothing to say. Really, I don't. Except, you know, al-haya halu enjoy life. Really. Because I can't claim to know anything more than anyone else. No, no one's saying that. I'm just inviting people. When I say al-haya halu, it's not like people don't know. I'm just inviting them. So you said something earlier. I want to just get back to that when we before we started about memory. And you said that, oh, yeah, I don't remember anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, walk me through this. I had to make a lot of notes to answer your questions today. <laughs> and that is um, because when I was young, and I, to me it was a very traumatic youth, one of the ways to reinvent myself and to, when I, that's at the time when I joined the Sea Cadets and I told you I wanted to explore sure. and find myself. One of the ways I discovered, it took me a long time, that I could move forward with myself was to not harp on the past. So I trained myself to not think of the past. The problem is, be careful what you wish for, because now I don't remember what I ate yesterday. Literally. You think that's a, you trained yourself to be that way? It's so interesting. I, I kept doing at it, and then all of a sudden I realized that I don't remember. Like, I'm just here with you now. I'm with you here now. When I go out, I'll be thinking of something else. And yeah, if I think long enough, I'll remember that I was here and I was with you. And I remember more like notions and emotions rather than factual things. I'd be a blessing. Like I know I love the lighthouse and I like to go there on a Friday morning. <laughs> if you tell me, what did you have last time? I'll tell you. That I remember. We, we tried the avocado on toast. But and you see, wait, wait, I'm giving you a plug here. <laughs> and, go ahead. And uh, we always like the granola. Yes. You guys make it in the house? We make everything is made in the house, including the granola. A friend of mine had it this morning. Like my friend, Chef Orfeli, says, it's all in the quality of the ingredients. 100%. That's like 90% of it. I think that's and 100%. passion is the other 10%. Yes, I think that's 100% right. But taste has memory, and you know that. So that's a very easy way to jog your memory if you forget something. Thank you so much. It's been a Thank pleasure. You. I, I, it's, I'm so honored. Uh, no, the honor is ours. And uh, 
wonderful conversation. And inshallah, more to come when you inshallah. when your book comes out and is fully published. And we will sell it at the Lighthouse, by the way. We'll Which ask book? you to come back your children's book or many many other book, maybe your memoirs next. We'll have I, another I, session. I, I worked on my memoir for my kids, okay. only for my kids. It's, I'm working on it, and I've. Um, I'm working on fiction. Not to push you, but I can assure you there'll be many more people that would love to read your memoirs. Just from the little research I was able to find online, I can tell you that. You know, I, I may be tempted to do that and, and out of humbleness. Uh, um, I just don't feel that my personal things are for you know, important. But you know what would be interesting to write the story of Fetafit? Because it's a very, yeah, very interesting maybe, story. Exactly. Maybe just think I'm that. sure it's like the story of Lighthouse. You know, how did that happen? No, how did it become successful? There's... There's something that you can't define, right? And it's it's luck and it's uh, blessings. It's and all it's of it. I mean, I don't think you. It's luck as much as clears of a defeat. You have to position. I always say you have to position yourself in the way of luck, right? Yes. For for good things yeah, to of happen. Of course, of course. So, but then, but then luck comes along. One hundred percent. You're blessed with the right team. Always. You're blessed with the right luck. Fi haga keda that uh, happened at Fatafit. One hundred percent. That uh, maybe I'll write about that. As always, thank you for joining us on the Lighthouse Conversations. I'm Hashem Montasser, and this episode was produced by Chirag Desai. The old track was composed and played by Ihab Radwan. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or reach out to us on Instagram at the Lighthouse underscore AE and tell us what you think.